If I can introduce the next speaker, it's uh, Matthew Bayliss. And in fact, uh, Matthew may not remember, but actually Matthew and I were PhD students in Oxford many, many years ago, uh, studying very different things than we, uh, we do now. We both saw the light and moved across to this type of uh, work. But um, So Matthew is currently the head of department of um, a, a glo global a Department of Epidemiology and Population Health uh, at the University of Liverpool. And uh, without further ado, over to you, Matthew. Thanks very much, Guy. We'll talk about Oxford later. Um, thanks very much to Frank for inviting me and uh, putting all of this together. I have to say, uh, this is, it's very, very hard to follow Bill Koresh's talk. Um, this is a tough act now, especially as there's some overlap between my talk and his. Um, but we'll see how, we, uh, how I do anyway. What I'm going to talk about is where do uh, emerging diseases come from, what drives their emergence, and then from an area that I work in in particular with climate change, how we can use that information to explore what happens once a disease has emerged. So in terms of sources of novel pathogens, this work, in my case, arose from a project that I was leading a few years ago where we wanted to look at the effect of climate change on the global burden of disease of animals and humans in Europe. And we wanted to start with just a list, really, of all of the diseases of humans and animals in Europe. And we quickly discovered that list simply doesn't exist. People haven't compiled this sort of information, at least not at that time. So we set about producing our own database of pathogens, which we've called EID2, the Enhanced Infectious Diseases Database. And we've used automated procedures to extract information from uh, various sources without us imposing our own biases on what we, what we take. Uh, and I'll just give you an example here. The key thing that we have done in putting this database together is to exploit, uh, in particular, the information that's uploaded with sequences. So you won't be able to see this very clearly, but this is the metadata uploaded with a single gene sequence to GenBank. And it says up here that the organism is lacrosse virus. And it says down here that the host is Edes albopictus, the Asian tiger mosquito, and it says that it was obtained in the USA, actually specifically Dallas. So this gives us three pieces of useful information. Firstly, lacrosse virus must be found in the United States, Edes albopictus must be found in the United States, and lacrosse virus infects Edes albopictus. So our database takes that information on a big scale. This has led us into the world of big data. So within the NCBI taxonomy database, there's some 200 and something thousand species. And at the, uh, recently, it got to about 40 million gene sequences. So we've linked 19 million, about 20 million gene sequences to about 170,000 species. So we know the species that these sequences relate to. And of those, nearly 3 million have a host tag, suggesting they're the sequences of a pathogen, and the host is identified. And some nearly 7 million have a country tag, telling us where they are. And from that information, we've then gone into PubMed, into publications, to get additional information on things that are not present, not available in sequence databases. So we put all this together into a database as I described, and we published uh, some of the data sets from this recently in a scientific data paper, which I encourage you to look at and, uh, and tweet about, because then our online attention will go up even more. What you're looking at, one of the things that occurred to us once we had these data is that we can begin to think about how we are connected to other animals, to other organisms, through pathogens, very similar to some of the work that uh, Bill was talking about. So we know that humans are connected to certain animals through pathogens. Then what are those animals connected to? What other animals are they connected to? What's the network of, 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 uh, of animals connected through pathogens? So what you're seeing here is uh, thousands and thousands of tiny dots. Each one is a species, and the size of the dot is an indication of how many pathogens are known from it. And the lines connect organisms when they share pathogens. And the thicker the line, the more pathogens are shared. And then the software pulls together organisms that are sharing larger numbers of pathogens. Well, what you're seeing here, it's very beautiful. It's actually much more art than science. And you can't see the detail there. So let's focus in on the animals that we studied in the Enhanced Project, which was humans and about 50 
uh, domesticated animals commonly found around Europe. So this is the network from that. And it, we then ask the question, well, what, call, what, what, what are the... What, why, why are pathogens shared between certain animals? Is it because they live together? Is it because they're closely related phylogenetically, as, as Bill just talked about? Or is it that one eats another? So when we look at this network, we find evidence for all of those. So humans, domesticated animals, cluster together in the middle. We're sharing a lot of pathogens, and those species are sharing pathogens amongst each other, su suggesting that animals in close proximity, physically close proximity, do share a fair degree of pathogens. There's also strong evidence of phylogenetic relationships. So birds tend to be over here, rodents down here. There's links between horses and donkeys and so on. But also there's in interesting um, examples where, for example, cats link closely to rats and mice, suggesting even though they're not that closely related because one eats the other, there's a fair degree of sharing of pathogens. So the evidence from this work is that all three of these uh, factors are important. But we can then go into this in a bit more detail and think, well, what about the transmission route? What effect does that play? So if we were to just focus in on, let's say, respiratory pathogens, well, we're in you know, animals that are in respiratory contact with each other might share those pathogens. But if you don't get into close proximity with a certain species, you're unlikely to then share respiratory pathogens, for example. So let's break this down into pathogens which can be transmitted by different routes. Unfortunately, this is not easily visible for you, and I've only got a couple of examples. But these are pathogens, the network for pathogens which have uh, an environmental transmission route. Humans are in green here, and very hard for you to see, but I will tell you what you can see there, a very close, prox very close relationship between humans and rats and mice and cats and dogs. And that's quite possibly because we're exposed, I guess, to the uh, fecal material that those animals are leaving around our houses, around our gardens. I don't know the explanation, but that would be certainly one. If we were to look at foodborne pathogens, pathogens acquired by ingestion, we have a different network. And now humans are clustering mostly around farm animals, unsurprisingly, cows, sheep, rabbits, uh, chickens are close to us there. So we can see a really important I think the evidence is there's a very important effect of the transmission route on the network of pathogens and how we are connected to other species and how they are connected to other species. So there was a minor distraction. This then brings me to the very interesting subject of sexually transmitted diseases. How are we connected to animals through sexually transmitted pathogens? And are we, in fact? And if so, why? Well, you'll be delighted to know that the network for sexually transmitted pathogens is much weaker than, um, than the other transmission routes. But it is, there is still, we are still connected to other animals through STDs, uh, very weakly with only a few examples. As to why that is, that's probably best left to your imagination. This is certainly uh, one possibility, and uh, I strongly advise you to not Google any of this stuff to prepare a talk. You can't do it at work. You can't do it at home with the family around. It's difficult. But in fact, it's not just this straightforward because Ebola is a very interesting example. Uh, Ebola is, as we know, transmitted through food and it's transmitted through direct contact. So we can acquire it that way, but we now know as well that we can also transmit it sexually. So it's not this is not saying that those pathogens that connect us to animals have to have been acquired uh, in this way. So, the evidence is we're very strongly connected to other animals through zoonotic pathogens. So how many zoonotic pathogens are there? Well, there's a very well-known paper, Taylor et al., uh, which produced a list of 1,415 human pathogens and suggested that about two-thirds, 61% of them, are zoonotic. I think it's actually more interesting to ask what proportion of the pathogens of animals are able to infect humans. And a paper in the same uh, edition of the journal by Cleveland et al. tried to get at this. They broke down pathogens into livestock pathogens and, and cat and dog pathogens, with about 46% infecting humans from livestock 
and about 70% infecting humans from cats and dogs. Our data from the EID2 database produces pretty similar patterns, in fact. Overall, we have about 43% of, of animal pathogens, of domesticated animals, are capable of infecting humans. I think what's really important to notice here, though, we have, in, in these what were the time, definitive uh, sets of data, 1,400 human pathogens, and the sum total of animal pathogens was, if you add these together, it's about 1,200, but there's a lot of overlap between the two. So this suggests that there's more pathogens in humans than the sum total of all the pathogens in 50 domestic animal species, which is very, very unlikely. And I would suggest that the evidence here then is actually there's a, a large reservoir of pathogens in animals that we've yet to discover. We simply don't look as closely at our domestic animals for pathogens as we do at humans. So what are the drivers of disease emergence? Well, here I overlap terribly with Bill. He mentioned a few times a really fantastic paper by Jones et al. with Peter Daszak in uh, America on uh, a study of emerging infectious disease events. I think Bill showed this slide of where uh, the main uh, occurrences are. And he definitely showed this slide, but I'm going to just go through it again. So this is, uh, this is I've filtered this for viral diseases. These are, this is an attempt to identify the drivers of human infectious disease outbreaks. And as Bill said, the most frequent one is land use changes, agricultural industry changes, very, very common. His own interest was bushmeat, which was way down here, and my own was climate change, which was also uh, way down there. As far as I know, no one has done a similar exercise for animal diseases, not on the same scale. What are the drivers that have led to the emergence of outbreaks in food animals or in animals in general? And I think that's a piece of work that needs to be done. My own attempt, though, not on, a, not on a big scale, just thinking through a few uh, viral disease emergencies in recent years, I don't think it's quite as simple as, I don't think you can, so for most disease outbreaks, pinpoint a single driver. So just taking one example, let's take uh, chikungunya. Chikungunya in this country, in Italy, why has it emerged in Italy? Well, in part it's because Aedes albopictus has spread here. In part, it's because chikungunya virus evolved to be able to be transmitted by Aedes albopictus. And partly, it's because people are traveling to countries where they acquire chikungunya virus, come back to Italy, and lead, give rise to a transmission event. So I don't think it's easy at all, in most cases, to pinpoint a single driver. And we need to be doing an exhaustive uh, exercise to really look at all of the possible drivers to explain uh, the emergence of, of diseases in our animals, which might then, if they're zoonotic, be able to infect humans. So what I'm going to do now is go on to my own work on climate as a driver. That's my particular expertise. And I have a background in vector-borne diseases, and in particular, um, a disease called blue tongue, which I'm going to hope you all know about, because I'm not planning to go through its epidemiology in, in detail. Blue tongues transmitted by culicoides biting midges. And it's emerged in Europe on a big scale. There's been a whole series of outbreaks going back to 1998. In particular, a big uh, outbreak that started in Northern Europe in 2006. One of the big questions about blue tongues emergence was, is it, was its emergence in any way driven by climate change? So we have taken some modeling approaches to look at this. This is the first one. This is the summary of the first one. We've used this thing called R0, which is a measure of the risk of a, uh, you can use it as a measure of the risk of a disease outbreak. And in our model, we have a, a sort of full model here that takes into account two things in particular. The, the effect of climate on the number of midges that are there, and the effect of temperature on the ability of those midges to transmit virus. On the right-hand side, we've just focused in on the ability of the midges to transmit the virus. So these are different years, going back to 1960. 
And these, this model is driven by the observed climate in Europe over that time, recorded climate. And these are anomalies. So a red bar is higher than the average uh, estimate for this R0, and a blue bar is a lower than average estimate of R0. So let's focus in on this one over here. So this is the reduced model, just looking at the ability of the images to transmit virus, as predicted in our model by temperature, observed in Europe, going back to the 1950s. And what you can see is that we predict, project that there's been a significant increase in that anomaly over the years, leading to, from around sometime in the late 90s into the 2000s in northwestern Europe, a big increase in the, in the risk of, in the ability of the midges to transmit virus. In our data set, this peaked in 2006, which was the, with the star there, happens to be, well, not happens to be, was the year that blue tongue virus was introduced into northern Europe. This wasn't engineered by us in any way. So our model does predict that the year that blue tongue did enter northwestern Europe was the year of highest risk out of the previous 50. But there'd been a gradual increase over many years and probably, possibly, many other opportunities that it could have entered the uh, country, entered the continent. But if we look down to southwestern Europe, where there's a longer history of diseases transmitted by culicoides, blue tongue outbreaks, and African horse sickness, which is another disease that they transmit, again, the stars indicate when outbreaks have actually occurred. And this modeling was the first evidence that actually previous outbreaks of diseases transmitted by culicoides in Europe have also occurred during times when there's been a positive anomaly, a temperature-driven positive anomaly in the ability of the midges to transmit viruses. And we don't see outbreaks, we haven't seen outbreaks when there's very low negative anomalies. So this provides very strong evidence, I believe, that climate change or climate variability is or has been the major driver of the emergence of blue tongue in Europe. So we've then gone from that work to looking at what happens when blue tongue virus is introduced into a country. And here we go back to more dots being joined up, which was the title that I, I, I took for this talk. And we have a, a model for the spread of blue tongue between farms, and it's a network model. So we connect farms by the movements of animals between them, as recorded in the UK. The movements of cattle, which we record individually uh, in the UK, following the foot and mouth outbreak in 2001. And the movements of sheep, which are recorded in batches. So a flock of sheep move from one farm to another. We know about it. And also the dispersal of vectors. So vectors spread from one farm to another uh, through, uh, by dispersal. So we have our farms in the UK connected in this way. It's a very complex model, which I'm not going to go into for obvious reasons. But these are simulations now of two viruses, blue tongue virus and into the UK and Schmallenberg virus, which I think you also know about as culicoides transmitted virus of the same animals. So this is the same model, the same farms, the same cattle and sheep, and the same movements of animals, but two different viruses. We've switched off any controls here so that animals are allowed to move, which is why these outbreaks have jumped. Blue tongue has jumped over here and here, and Schmallenberg has jumped. But as you can see, differences in the epidemiology of, of the viruses, the uh, incubation period of Schmallenberg, or the incubation periods, the viremic periods, and the ability to, trans to infect midges, leads to very different patterns in their rates of spread. So just to finish, this model is also climate sensitive in the sense that temperature affects the dynamics of the transmission of the viruses by the, uh, by the midges uh, through the uh, vectorial capacity, which is what uh, you're seeing here. And so we've then, I think uniquely uh, so far, we then have simulations for what happens if we seed the UK with blue tongue virus under different temperature conditions. So we've gone back to colder times, minus three degrees from the present up to uh, three degrees hotter than the present. And what you can see is that in terms of the dynamics of an outbreak, temperature does have, uh, as you might expect, I guess, an important effect on the size of an outbreak, in this case, blue tongue. But actually, we're seeing it tail off at around two degrees warmer than, uh, than the baseline 
uh, time. So to finish, in my last 30 seconds, just some conclusions. Animals are a major source of human pathogens, but I think we've got pretty poor knowledge of the pathogen reservoirs that animals have. Big data approaches, such as the one, such as the one that we're using, can help us uh, tackle this. Pathogen networks indicates that we share pathogens with our close phylogenetic relatives, cohabitants, and also through things that are eaten. Many factors drive the emergence of these pathogens into the human or animal population. Climate change is one. I strongly believe climate change has driven the emergence of some pathogens, in blue tongue being perhaps uh, one of the very best examples. And transmission models suggest that these outbreaks will be larger in future, uh, up to a certain point as the climate continues to warm. And I'll finish there and thank you all very much for listening. E e excellent, Matthew, uh, and, and really, really good to see uh, big data being used to do something rather than just spoken about. So that's re really nice. So if you can have a, up to two questions, technical questions. You, you can also talk to Matthew over, over, over coffee. Any questions? Well, you've, oh, over here. Oh. Um, sorry. Uh, your um, network spread of Schmallenberg, it spread and then it disappeared. I'm being very dim. Why did it disappear? Well, it didn't just disappear on the map. To all intents and purposes, it's disappeared yeah. you know, everywhere. Well, it's, it, it, in our simulations, it sweeps through almost the entire country and the animals on the farms become immune and that's the end of it. Uh, the reality, and that seems, it's, you know, it looks almost as though Schmallenberg swept across Europe and disappeared into the Atlantic somewhere. The actual evidence, I mean, we're doing a survey right now. There's a little bit of Schmallenberg still circulating. So I think uh, the animal population became immune, largely. The prevalence has dropped right down, but it hasn't disappeared. And it, will be, so it is circulating on a very low level. I, I, I have a question. Um, you, 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 I mean, we've seen the graph in terms of the, the types of drivers and, and obviously specific drivers being looked at. I mean, obviously, uh, climate change of, often causes other drivers to happen too, like yeah. land use change. What, what happens if you do a sort of combinatorial type simulation or, or do people not do that? Well, that is exactly what we are planning to do. Uh, it's all, um, so the work that we're doing is looking at the effects of temperature change in parts, but then we're also going to be playing around with the density of farms and the types of movements that are happening so that we can begin to see how those things compare. We haven't done it yet. Uh, I'm sure that you know, other drivers, I guess the point I often make is that climate change is important, but it's happening on a relatively long time scale and, and slowly, whereas other drivers can effectively come about overnight. And it's quite difficult for, to, to keep uh, for climate, the signal of climate change effect on disease to come through that. So I think with a fuller modeling exercise, we might see a smaller role of climate coming through. 